we really don't like to rely on high definition stock video because I feel like it really pulls you out of the era. Defunct Land started out as a VR project and is a YouTube series created by filmmaker Kevin Perjurer. With a focus on theme parks and themed entertainment experiences, Kevin guides audiences through colorful, dramatic and often surprising narratives of nostalgia, business and creativity. Each video tells a story where surprising connections are made between the world of theme parks and the world outside it, or even the entanglement between these two worlds. Going through scripts, editing timelines and references from his latest work Defunct Land, the American Idol theme park experience, Kevin shares his vision and provides insight into the long process of making Defunct Land videos from start to finish. Welcome to you. Thank you for joining us, uh, Kevin. Uh, we are really excited to learn all about your process. So to get started, uh, where do you begin for making a uh, Defunct Land video and how uh, yeah, do you start conceptualizing? Um, yeah, so each video develops differently, but really when I find a good eye-catching subject matter that I feel hasn't been explored a lot, I will try to focus in on that. So for instance, this video, the one that I've most recently released, is about a American Idol experience, um, which was a, you know, based on the television show American Idol, and it was a theme park version of it, and it brought along with it a lot of interesting uh, concepts in how it was operated, as well as allowing for kind of a look at early 2000s pop culture and which allowed me to go down a path. So really, if I can find a topic that has something that's very interesting at the surface and then has a way to go down a more cultural path or historical path, uh, a lens into an era or uh, some sort of, you know, subtle but obvious commentary. And in this case, it being kind of about the uh, this this episode being about American Idol. It talks a lot about stardom and a celebrity and celebrity idolization and and that type of of thing at, at its at its deepest kind of level but at the top level it is just about a theme park attraction um and that also comes with a lot of interesting um history as well so that's how that's how i start um and i can talk about how i start researching after i've decided the topic if you'd like yeah yeah please do yeah let's go ahead so it usually starts with a with an intake period where I'm just trying to find as many sources as possible, and that usually leads me uh, down newspaper archives or um, blog archives, depending on the era. So this was '90s, early 2000s. So this still newspapers are still the primary uh, source of information. Um, but if it was a newer topic, I would find myself on forums a lot more, something that was archived in the internet. If I needed to, for a lot of topics, including this one, I will try to source physical media magazines that don't exist on online archives through some sort of seller of, you know, I recently purchased a lot of uh, physical editions of a magazine from the 60s and then would archive that on my individual basis, trying to go past what's just available on the internet. But with a video like this, a lot of it was archived. So you can see this is kind of our very rough source list. And as I'm going through uh, trying to determine what the narrative is going to be, because I always let the narrative come from the truth. I don't try to create a formatted structure and then force the history into it. I try to find what the most interesting way to tell the history is. And so the first thing to do is just do an intake process. So I'll find, I'll go to a newspaper archive, I'll find a newspaper article, and then I'll just start writing down very general notes. As you can see, these are the ones that are kind of left over um, from what didn't actually make it into the paragraphs above here. Um, but this is kind of what it is where it's just it's important dates. Uh, this is a something that I thought could start the, the episode and ended up not starting the episode. Um, and then just little facts like this Frank Sinatra fact that didn't make it into the original cut. But this is as you can see, just a lot of information. And so then it's just pages and pages of very crude, rough, historical fact. Um, and then always trying to keep the sources somewhat contained. And especially if there's a quote, trying to know where we can you know, cite those later on. And so I'll, I'll try to keep a source list like this. Sometimes it looks a little better than this. 
sometimes uh it looks even worse than this one does but always trying to make sure we can go backtrack and find where this information is coming from but because what we're extracting is so often general fact um like you know this attraction started on this day not really specific to one source but something that's a general truth that's the stuff that ends up in here and then trying to find some sort of chronological narrative for this video i ended up deciding to do a split narrative so you you track the history of american idol at the same time you're tracking the history of the theme park that american idol will eventually be in and then towards the middle it converges um and i felt that was the best way to go about this this specific history video yeah because i think uh in the video there's a very clear uh, there are very clear chapters and there's there's maybe also even a mm -hmm. sense of like sub chapters that that's already sort of uh those chapters are already be taking shape in your your research maybe even before you start writing the script or how does that come in uh it just depends on this one it was something that was you know made later on because i'm always thinking about the expectations of the audience um mm -hmm. and knowing that this video is going to be called something similar to defunct land the american idol experience people that came for american idol will get that very quickly uh people that came for theme parks you know that in the original draft wasn't going to come in until 10 15 minutes in um, and because I do long form content, that's a long time for someone to not experience that. But I'm also not the type of creator that will start a video with in this video, we're going to talk about these topics. Mm -hmm. Let's do it and and kind of do a fourth wall breaking. I, it, the, the history starts. You're in the history. I never stop. I never break. I never talk to you uh, too directly every now and then, but n never like a true intro of you know, here's the summation. Now here's the long version. It's always just, here's the long version. And so the reason for that is this one, eventually I was reading the script and I was realizing that, and I might've even come in the edit phase. Honestly, the script might still be in the original mm -hmm. order where the Disney MGM studios theme park here, um, is coming in at, at page three. So maybe this is the, the newer version, but just the idea of this is, um, the theme, you don't hear about the theme park very soon. So that had to a restructuring had to happen mm -hmm. and that's just on an individual basis that's just trying to make the right call for what the audience is expecting and trying to and and what each audience is expecting because very rarely am i speaking to just a singular group of people um and trying to make sure that every group feels taken care of uh in in the in the progression of events in the video and when you say the the different groups do you mean the people who came for the, the theme park stuff and the people who came for the American Idol stuff or, or are there more than just those two groups? Yeah, I mean, there's there's there, there are those two groups as far as this video, as far as what the title is going to lead people to click on. But then there's also what what amount of knowledge even within those groups people have. So if you're a person that wants to learn about theme parks, maybe you've never even heard of of anything. Maybe you've never been to one. Um, and then there's other people that this is their ever they've seen every video of mine or they've seen every theme park history video there is and know everything there is to know they just don't know about this specific attraction mm -hmm. um and trying to make sure that both of those groups of people feel that the video is for them yeah is something that i've de developed over a long time um mm -hmm. and trying to ha have certain signals uh to both audiences no matter their knowledge or entry point right because i think in this video there's like a bit about Michael Eisner uh, mm -hmm. in around like eight minutes, which feels very much like having seen your, your other videos, like you already sort of like have this sense of, oh boy, this is gonna like go somewhere. Yeah, because who is Michael Eisner? Um, yeah, Kevin, could you maybe explain it <laughs> in like two sentences? Yeah, yeah, The uh, Michael Eisner was the CEO of the Walt Disney Company for the majority of their theme park construction projects. So he, he was CEO for 20 years. And so he's a common character because he is uh, he was very involved in the production of of Disney theme parks and therefore in theme parks in general. And because that's my focus, he's been he's become kind of a uh, a running gag or just a, mm -hmm. a constant character because he is the he is a big he's probably one of, if not the biggest influence other than Walt Disney in the theme park space. So just kind of an, an, an inevitability and in that that there's humor derived from the inevitability of of his presence. Yeah, like in a certain uh, like notoriety, maybe also even. Yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And also, you're saying we, but you're also saying at some point, <clears throat> uh, this this is an individual uh, endeavor. Let's say, 
Um, who is we and when does we come into play? Is that at the early beginning or? Uh, it depends. Um, I say we because I'm, I don't make the videos alone, but I also am the primary force behind every part of the process. Um, so uh, as far as script writing in recent years, it's only me um, mm. in, in editing is where I usually bring in other editors that I work with. Um, and then, you know, the editors work very closely with the script and you can see that there's no, this is the, what you're seeing here is the, uh, already recorded version with notes for editors. And this is something I've done somewhat recently. And as I, I bring on other editors to tell them, to give them signals to essentially what I want here. Um, and, and so that's the color coding here. The, uh, the green is, uh, already recorded and then other colors signify other things and for, and that's for the editors that does not have anything to do with research or script writing but uh but after the editors assemble i also come in and, and edit as well right so so let's say the the script is finished uh like where does the the editing uh or recording of a voice over like like what do you start with um so i record the the the, the script and then i hand it to an audio editor who will um, take out all the gaps, take out all the uh, me messing up, the flubs, um, and then we'll deliver a pretty consistent audio track that matches the script. And then once we have that, and sometimes before we have that, sometimes we'll create uh, automated voice. You know, if I want, if I like long videos like this, we don't have the luxury of just doing the whole script, getting the script perfect, recording it, and then and then handing it off to editors. So after I will get the first act done or the first few pages done will either create a, a very uh, awful sounding robot voice to um, to, so the editor can have something to edit off of. And then we will replace it with my real voice um, or I will record in chunks if the video is long enough. Mm -hmm. And so I will record the first six pages and then keep writing the rest. So my editor can, can get started. And do you also work then with uh, with storyboards for this process? Not common. Um, with 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 a within a video like this, I I don't ever storyboard um, mm. because we are because this is a found archival footage type video. Mm. So this is all stuff that exists, and we kind of have to figure out how to represent each sentence. I don't write with visuals in mind. Um, I, I, I write completely free of visuals and in the, in a perfect world. And then it's the challenge of my editors and me to fill these words. And sometimes we don't have, we don't have the media. And so we have to get really creative as to how to represent certain sentences. Right. Um, and we really don't like to rely on high definition stock video because I feel like it really pulls you out of the era. Mm -hmm. So it, we have to find other ways to signify things. And that gets very difficult, uh, especially when it comes to general sentences. Um, mm. But but that's a uh, thing, sentences about history that don't necessarily have an image attached, but are still very important to the story. But I, I don't I don't edit myself with visuals in mind when I'm in the script writing phase, because I think that it results in a more uh, cohesive narrative at the, in the end. Yes, yeah. maybe then we can take a yeah. look at your uh, at your editing process. Because you're saying then it gets a challenge to fill those uh, to fill those sentences. Um, how do you mm -hmm. collect then those images? Because some have to be some somewhat generic, I suppose, uh, while others have to be very specific. And sometimes you have to sort of make a filler. Uh, wh where do where do you uh, collect those? And how do you sort of like uh, decide where it, during your editing process also how to use those? Uh, yeah. So you know, there's certain times where we rely and it, and it has a double purpose we will show the newspaper article where the information is coming from um we try not to do too many of those in a row because it's the easiest thing to do and it would feel like you're just looking at a bunch of newspapers <laughs> um but this is a good way to both cite our sources show where this information is coming from show that i'm not just making it up but not uh but but also it does it has this feedback loop in the mind where i say something and then you see exactly where it's coming from. So your mind kind of fills in that visual gap, even though this is just text. Um, it feels like part of the story, um, even yeah. though there's no imagery in that picture. Other times, you know, we will rely on, you know, here th this is like, okay, well, that's just a shot of Universal Studios. 
a very generic shot of Universal Studio, a very generic shot of Disney MGM, know. you know, trying to find those um, types of imagery, establishing shots, kind of, but it's archival, so it's not as easy, but they exist. Like what you What's mentioned, that? like you don't want to use stock footage because then it looks like too contemporary. So like this, these, this, yes. this archival material is like from the, the same time period, the narrative of the video would take place, yes. I assume. Exactly. And so we'll try to find stuff that, you know, these companies have released via press packages. Um, and, and, and a lot of these are press imagery that they created back in the day. And so some people, some of these have been uploaded to YouTube. Sometimes if it's the case where Disney owns it or a big company owns it, we'll rely on fair use and assume that this was created for promotional and, and uh, editorial purposes in the first place. Um, and then other times, if it is, I'll try to find one here, like that we would reach out to someone if it, they took the footage themselves and mm -hmm. and clear it. And so in terms of the clearance of footage in a video like this, especially when we get into talking about later on some of the bigger, you know, uh, American Idol type stuff where a lot of people took video themselves. I would go through a process of clearing that with those videographers mm -hmm. and then creating like a bin of like these are the clips that we have approved use as much of this as possible and whatever whatever gaps we have left that's when we'll rely on fair use um but trying to use as much uh as much approval as possible especially when it comes to uh, videographers um the rest we do rely on fair use for for uh stuff like that because of our the size of our operation but yeah so once we do that you know, just always trying to fill it with something relevant, but not too specific to be distracting. It's a very fine line. Uh, a good example also here is um, talking about the idea of celebrity in the early 2000s. Um, we would use, at, and we were, in this case, we are talking about the iPod specifically, but we would use um, the advertising campaign that, I, that Apple did. We, we used a clip of that early in the video to represent the concept of celebrity because or the concept of of of, uh, of becoming a star because apple had a series of advertisements of this era where the person with the ipod was like a pop star but it really represented that concept when nothing else kind of would um and so that was a good type of filler um imagery to to fill that in to you know you can be your mm -hmm. own star a, a type of sentence that really doesn't have an image specifically attached to it yeah, sort of a sign of the times, not necessarily directly connected, but it is part of that era, let's say. That you are, that you are. Exactly. Talking. Yeah. And um, uh, then then about the pacing of your video, is that also something that you, you already mentioned also in the script and uh, that you want to, uh, you, you're not having the audience in mind while writing? When does the audience come into the editing? Yeah, so the the... The audience is always in mind in the scripting phase. The the visuals being in mind is the thing that we wait on. But oh, sorry, as yeah. far as the audience, the the audience in the editing phase, trying to, if you can see, there's a very similar amount of clips here. We want because when we think about when I think about script writing, I think about story and pacing and narrative and how it's affecting people emotionally. But when we're in the edit bay we're thinking about visuals and how it affects people visually and from an eye perspective we don't want things to linger but we also don't want the cuts to be so quick um because that, that's going to affect the way people psychologically associate the words being said if i the same sentence at the exact same pace read with six cuts is going to feel faster choppier more energetic than the same sentence with one cut and so yeah. trying to find and, and also when we're thinking about relying on um, a lot of fair use, the trying to cut more often, trying to show that we are just using exactly what we need is also helpful. But just from a visual perspective, trying to give people breaks, you know, how many images do we have in a row? How many videos do we have in a row? If the video, for instance, something like this, it's very flashy. There's lights going on. Does the previous one have lights going on? I mean, these are the type of decisions mm -hmm. we're making about, you know, you watch this specific video and okay, in within the video, there's flashing lights. Well, maybe after that, they need a visual break, something more s mellow. And, and that's mm. kind of where we're uh, constantly. And then it, when it comes to reading things, and I uh, can try to find something like this, you know, trying to make sure that we stay within our uh, title and action safe zones. You can barely see the yellow lines here. You probably can't see it at all because of how white mm. this is. Mm. Um, you can see it in this case. Um, but trying to make sure that the 
uh, the flow of imagery isn't too fast that that we're are your eye is being drawn toward the thing that I want you to read and the thing that I want you to be read is not distracting from what I'm saying um, mm -hmm. and it was not too long that it feels like you're running out of time to read it um, is, is a big part of this as well. Yeah, so 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 it's it's um, uh, in the end. Then um, I, I'm wondering what the uh, what the final decisions are that you make. Like um, uh, maybe to kill your darlings could be really hard because you go into quite many directions and there's so many links to make. Um, how is that mm -hmm. in 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 the process? And is that also in the in the editing phase also happening a lot? Or by the editing phase, it's not happening a ton, but it does happen, um, and it mainly happens with humor. I will cut hmm. a lot of jokes um, because either they're not landing for me or I don't think they're that funny. Or when you watch the video, the jokes feel out of place. I always want the jokes to feel very natural and be uh, a addition and not a distraction. But in yeah. the, in general, my, the, what they say in script in screenwriting at least is, is if it's not necessary, cut it. And I, and I don't necessarily agree with that. I, especially in terms of documentary, I think some of the best parts of documentaries are the things that are not necessary, but are interesting. Um, so, and so what I basically say is, and, and that's a hard line. So what I try to tell people when I'm working with them or in cases like this is if it's not necessary and it's not entertaining, because entertaining to me is a lot different than interesting interest as far as a, well, that's, that's something that I found interesting. That's something that I found um, cool is a lot different than that's something that I found fun. And that's yeah. something that I, that made me feel one's much more intellectual and the other's much more emotion. One's more thinking and the other's more in your heart. Um, and so if, and sometimes a fun fact can be entertaining and those are the ones we keep, but there's also times where you hear a fun fact and it is interesting, but it's not, it doesn't make you feel it's not entertaining. doesn't make you laugh. doesn't make you ponder. It just makes you say, Oh, that's cool. That's, and, and, and that's not enough to keep. So that is when we start to cut things that are not super uh, necessary. Yeah. And then, and then it's, uh, then it's finished at some point. Um, like it's, it's, it's quite a long process in your, um, uh, in, in your case. Um, so, yes. um, what are the last steps to, to make before putting it online? Like the title, thumbnail, uh, things like that. Are that also parts that you really think a lot about before you, um, you know, I, m my thumbnails are created in the time it takes to upload the video. Um, oh. I really, and I, and I, and I don't know if that's a, if that's a good suggestion, uh, <laughs> but it's been okay for me. It's yeah. worked okay. Um, you know, uh, I know a lot of people put a lot of effort in th into their thumbnails, um, and I don't as much. Um, but I do think about them, and and that, but that comes from the moment the video is conceived. Um, it's mm -hmm. more of, is there iconography here, and that, and that that's more of the cynical side to it. The less, you know, uh, is is the with American Idol, I know there's iconography with Hollywood Studios. I know there's iconography with other things that I've done. I've known there's an image or a a logo or a location that will draw the eye. And that was going to make its way into the thumbnail eventually. But as far as actually making the thumbnail, very quickly. Mm -hmm. As far as title goes, I'm always thinking about the title. What's the title of this? Is this a good title? I'll type it out, see how it looks. Um, and the decision whether to put my channel name, Defunct Land, at the beginning or not um, is always kind of a back and forth in my mind. And and typically I decide to do defunct land at the beginning. I feel that the brand is strong enough on the platform and that it defunct land, the, 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 the good part about that name is that it also kind of tells you what the video is. It's about something that is defunct. It's not just my name. It's not just a title that's distracting you. It kind of gives you a, a perspective on what you're about to watch. Um, and I think that was a really smart decision that I made by complete accident years and years ago. Um, so I can't really take credit for that one. That was a happy, nice. happy accident. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so anyways, as far as titles and thumbnails go, I'm, I'm always trying to think about them, but as far as making them, it usually is in the couple hours it takes to upload that I'm, uh, very quickly trying to make a thumbnail. Um, yeah, I think we also had some, some more questions, uh, not specifically about this video, but I think, uh, about your content in general. Mm, okay. And one of them that I'm actually curious about now, uh, I think which also relates to your use of, of archive material is uh, the, the theme of nostalgia. Um, mm -hmm. I think on your own website, you write that this like 
is a big theme in your videos. And I was wondering about it because your videos do revisit topics of pop culture's past, but rather than just indulging in nostalgia, you actively reflect uh, on people's ideals and ambitions of that time. Uh, like in the American Idol video, you mentioned body image stuff and our relation to fame uh, as something admirable back then, which I think has changed quite a lot. Mm -hmm. mm, so yeah, how do you balance this more critical lens with a uh, general enthusiasm, I, I guess, you have for, for theme parks and attractions? Well, that's a great question. And it, it is it's difficult um, because I think I have a, a lot stronger views than you'll see in the video. Um, mm. I try to keep the video to what is true. And... And and obviously my my own perspective plays a part in that, but the tr but truth is is very revealing, um, and I feel that every era of of humanity, I'm a very pro humanity person. I, I I have a deep faith in in humans, and also I'm very very critical at the same time of them, um, and uh, we're we're definitely a fa a fascinating creature, and so to look at back at an era. Um, I think the easiest thing to the, the the two easiest things to do is one is to look back with, you know, this lens of a pure nostalgia where you oh the things were better then it was so much better back in two thousand three than it is now, um, yeah. and the other one is to say well everyone then was awful and it's it was the worst time ever, and you know rarely I mean it's never are both true but neither are not true it's but it's all true and. Because there were people that lived in every time period with great ambition and ideas and true mm. human love for for each other and and the planet or whatever it may be, and there was people that that truly were obsessed with you know greed or 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 whatever it may be. It's a it's a it is it's ongoing. And when it comes to specific issues, um, the differences are the most obvious. So in this case with American Idol, you're thinking of. Well, the early 2000s, you know, it has the music you like. It had the celebrities you loved as a kid that you you love music. You loved the fashion. But also think of the difference in, in body image. Think of what the reason for this. Why? Why did this? Why was American Idol a thing? Um, and that is a lot less commentary of me saying this is how I feel. I That's just inherently true. It, it, there's nothing false. And there's I don't think there's anything debatable about that that um about the things that i'm saying but it does come across as commentary and it, and it, and i think the inclusion of it in a story that could otherwise be pure nostalgia uh feels much more like commentary um even though that i i personally don't believe it to be commentary i think it is just what happened um body image has changed a lot and i think body image has changed to be more inclusive um but the mentioning of that feels purposeful and it is mm -hmm. so it's 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 kind of the hard line to walk about what truths do you focus on um and i think trying to make something that doesn't because I, I consider myself a documentarian not a video essayist mm -hmm. um because a video essayist i feel is somebody that begins with a thesis and then provides evidence they, they begin with a claim or an idea and then they try to prove it and what i try to do is i try to tell a true story and from that claims or truths are d derived it's much more like a scientific method type of history than than me going in with an intention to tell you something um but but that's kind of how i approach that and, and i hope that the videos are nuanced and the celebration is coming from a place of like even in the worst times there have been great people and even in the best times there have been bad people and that is that's not a contradiction that's just life and and if you focus on one period in history i think that you see it all. And so you would, you need to have a deep reverence, but you also need to have a critical eye. It's it, you have to have both. Otherwise you're not doing the full job of, of, of being uh, in anthropology or, or, or cultural examin examination. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then I'm also wondering about the, um, because you say I'm, I'm a document documentarian. Um, what mm -hmm. is the freedom that it gives you to uh, make these videos in on YouTube and not maybe in, the more common places for documentarians uh, to share their work. Is there something, yeah, I, I can imagine uh, obviously that a theme park content would not necessarily make it through for a, for a, for a television show, for example, or, or a documentary or, film festival. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you reflect on that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think the, the top, I think, I think there's a few reasons. Um, I talk about large cor uh, corporations in the entertainment industry. Um, and I think that the entertainment industry itself 
um, it doesn't really have space for that. I, I think it's actually starting uh, a little bit. Um, but, but the, uh, but yeah, it's it, to go around and pitch a show to, uh, one of the four major studios about how the other major studio is bad. It's, it's not <laughs> the best from a business perspective for those that would want to sign up for that. But I do think that, um, being in it, 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 these, the topics, it, it's kind of a reversal, um, of the, your typical entry point to a documentary because many documentaries, and there's nothing wrong with this, um, it's just different, um, is that a lot of documentaries lead with the big harm or the big controversy or the big conspiracy or the big um the big bad um or it's uh you know it's a documentary uh, about crime or something that's very in your face and very much like when you see that title when you see that poster you know basically the message or the the theme of the documentary and i think here with um with my videos is i think it's almost like a medicine you know, through uh, like giving medicine through cheese, or, or or I don't know a good analogy of <laughs> of 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 sneaking in medicine to to something else, uh, because it's basically you get the societal commentary, and it doesn't take a sharp sharp turn typically, but you also are going you're getting you're, you're going into it with this more nostalgic lens, and and I think that and more of a human interest lens of well, what is this even about? Like, I don't, I've never heard of this before. Yeah. Um, while other documentaries would rely more on, and, and even some of mine do rely more on, uh, on you already knowing about the subject and basically wanting to engage with it again. Yeah. We have one more question before we open it up to the audience or maybe two. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, because like what, what you're mentioning about, uh, sort, sort of this freedom you have on YouTube, um, for your mm -hmm. yeah, theme park content, it, it also reminds me, uh, like, I think theme park content is like a specific niche that uh, has been like an online culture and cultural niche for quite some time. I think of early, earlier internet forums that would be dedicated to theme parks and roller coasters. Um, and I think nowadays, like we've seen the stereotype of the millennial uh, Disney adult, like this sort of uncritical mm -hmm. fan in the sort of Stan era um and to me you like don't fall in in either one of those categories i don't know how you how you sort of yeah see yourself in this uh online theme park content landscape um yeah i i think that i i don't think i fall into the category um of of the the more uh the the, the pixie dust the magic um of it but i also don't fall into the category of those people are are ridiculous either you know it is it is kind of um i i don't know i think it's a very nuanced especially in terms of how people culturally engage with this especially recently in the past four or five years mm -hmm. um is is a much more nuanced conversation um than than either side is is you know completely right it, it is you know it but i think my my thing is i'm not deeply in love and to a certain extent I am in with the subject matter, but I'm not deeply in love with any corporation. Um, but I also don't find it um, absolutely ridiculous. I think it is, it, it's, it's definitely interesting. And I think it's a byproduct of bigger societal forces. And I think that that kind sure. of position where I, I don't, I would never make a video bashing Disney adults or people that, or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, trying mm -hmm. to think of something else, people that were really into a specific thing. People that love Lord of the Rings are, are ridiculous and, and they just want to live in a fantasy world. Um, but I also wouldn't say that anybody that engages with any corporation uncritically or anything in, in life uncritically um, have the, have the, the moral high ground or, or in any, in any sense, it is just this, like what it, I'm just more interested in. It. I think from an audience perspective, I am, the the conduit to where a lot of people are where they don't have a deep-seated hatred for people that love theme parks they don't have a deep-seated hatred for theme parks but they also are not in love with them themselves and that entry point is more accessible and it's also how i feel i'm very conflicted on all these things mm -hmm. um and i i think it's the you you know spend your whole life seeking some sort of truth and getting close but probably you know passing on before you're able to really get there because that's just the nature of of life and i think that that, that that that's where I'm always at. I'm always trying to to take more in, to look at more sides, um, and and not just subscribe to one mentality. And I hope that's what people come to the videos for. That they're more, that they come looking for that type of like 
let's not pick a side. Let's actually look at this very strange world <laughs> and recognize its strangeness, but also recognize its interests and its beauties, but also its harms and, and the whole the whole package, I guess. Yeah, then then the last question. Um, <laughs> there, there are many more that we could ask, but uh, this one uh, as the last one. How often do you visit the uh, Disney theme parks or theme parks in general? And, and how do you experience them? Um, I visit them often. Um, I I live in Florida, so I'm near Walt Disney World and Universal. Um, and I, I do visit them often. Um, not not every day by any means, um, but uh, a lot more often than, than I did when I was living in the Midwest of the United States and was not mm. near any of them. Um, and when I'm there, uh, sometimes I'm there with looking for ideas, looking for interesting aspects, trying to find uh, something to to discuss. And sometimes I'm just there with friends to enjoy it. I, I try to try to do both. And you're still it's definitely able to... doing this. To... Yes, I am. I am. I'm able to en I'm able to enjoy it. Absolutely. I mean, these places are built for enjoyment and that's what they're good at. So it's yeah. very easy to uh, to fall into that. You know, they make the food taste good to. And so when I eat it, it tastes good. And when they make the rides fun. And so when I ride them, they're fun. <laughs> But when when I do when I do go and and start questioning things from a historical basis or a cultural basis, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's also fun because I love doing that. Yeah. I love I love digging deep uh, into these things. That's what I I mean. That's that's what I've dedicated a large por portion of my life to by now. And and it's it is just I'm very grateful to be able to do it. So it, it, it's never uh, I'm not it doesn't ruin anything for me um, because I was always even as when I went as a kid, I was just looking around at this place and saying, how do they do that? How does that work? Why do they do that? And, and rather than probably enjoying it more from a, wow, this is great perspective that most people do. Um, so it's it's really not that different because it's where I've always I've always been wondering why how, why isn't this line going faster? Is there a way to make lines go faster? And you know how does how does how does this ride work? Why did they do that? Who made this? And so it's it's I guess it's just who I am. Um, so it's worked out, but it is it you know I might be a little exhausting to visit a theme park with. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, we have a, a an audience here, uh, and although we don't have a camera on them, we can hand them a mic, and then you'll be able to hear them um, if they have any questions. Of yeah. course. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Hi, Kevin. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, uh, my name is Martijn, uh, and um, I really enjoyed your uh, talk because it reminds me a little bit of this Dutch podcast called The Kleine Boodschap which is from uh, two um, men who are extremely uh, big fans of uh, the Efteling, this uh, theme park in the Netherlands. And every week they uh, produce a three-hour-plus-long podcast about the Efteling. It can go about the food <laughs> or the toilets or, uh, the, the you know, everything. But the Efteling is a really beautiful place. But the thing is that they always, sometimes they are like, yeah, yeah, but we're still journalists. Uh, and what I always find mm. really interesting with them is that they go extremely deep and they have like the most interesting uh, conversations about the deep history of the Efteling, which maybe comes from uh, the name. And then they found out, oh, it was actually established in the 17th century and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So they do extremely deep dives and they are fans, but they also consider them themselves to be journalists. And I think that's also really interesting because if we think about, let's say, cinema, from the beginning, cinema was already some kind of art form and journalists were talking about film, although it was a new medium, as something to be taken serious, but we never thought about theme parks as something that we have to approach also from a journalistic perspective. So my question is, do you consider yourself a journalist? <laughs> oh, that's a great, that's a great question. Um... I, I think I, I think I do at the activities that a journalist does. Um, and I think I would stop myself short of journalist and maybe it's my own definition, but I think a journalist would probably focus a bit more of their efforts and their work toward um, toward a general reporting of of facts. And I think I do consider an audience and the entertainment of any story 
as much as I do the facts. Um, so, you know, when I'm interviewing people and when I'm finding primary sources and when I, especially when I'm interviewing people that worked on these things where I'm doing studies, I did, you know, done mathematical simulations of theme parks. That's when I really do feel like this, this is journalistic work. Um, but I do spend most, uh, not most, but I do spend a lot of my time doing other work as well, which is much more on an entertainment basis. You know, what music should go here? What visuals should go here? So I, I definitely agree with you. Absolutely. And I, and I appreciate that you see theme parks similarly because it is, it is a medium of art. Um, and so I do think I straddle that line of filmmaker, journalist, and a little bit of an art critic at times um, in, in a space that isn't really you know, perceived that way. So I, I think it's a little bit of everything, but yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And that's a, that was a great question. And uh, I, I need to go to Aftling. Thanks. That was great. Daniel here. Uh, I was wondering to what extent do you see these theme parks as like a, a microcosm of the bigger world outside? So in a way allows you to kind of approach on a smaller scale processes or dynamics that are happening on a larger scale in, in society uh, as such. And also just, I'm curious to hear about your uh, background, you know, because it's very hard to categorize. Like, are you, are, do you have an artistic background or are, um, did you do like film school or, uh, yeah. And also can you make a living with what you do? So I guess, I guess. three questions. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. You might have to, I might have to get reminded of, of, of them all, but the, the first one being, do I see theme parks as a microcosm of, of, of larger societal issues? And I, I think the answer is absolutely yes. In the same way that the films of any time period reflect certain values as well as critiques, as well as wants and needs of society. I think theme parks are interesting in that they are a physical manifestation of these ideas. As the world around us, we feel, and at least in the United States, I can speak to this, I think we feel the world around us has become less uh, manicured and less um, predictable. Um, and I think that's a feeling rather than a truth in some ways based off of, of our overstimulation of, of, of news and of, of media. And I think that, you know, as we as we think that our own uh, urban spaces or rural spaces become less manicured, we we look to theme parks to be the perfect manicured, planned uh, break from a world that we view as chaotic. And in, and in different ways, we look at um, theme parks as a way um, to provide us with in the overstimulation that our our cell phones, our technology, our computers want us to have the promise of of this constant immersive simulation of reality that that our technology promises but can't deliver. Theme parks, I think, people go to them as the, as almost an answer to that, as as the full immersion of of a of a digital world. Even though theme parks are a, are a physical manifestation of na of reality, it is a digital nature. It is a it is a fake nature and, and i think there's a lot there so i could talk about that forever but i'm gonna have to move on but i agree and i think that's what makes them so interesting um uh and, and so from what was the second question uh we, we had what's your background and my background. can you make a living my, off of this well i can answer that i do make a living off of this um i i don't know if i could make a living scaling this um i i i may i do i do well and i'm very grateful for what i have and i've been able to uh support my family and provide um and and that's been wonderful but uh and, and i do contracts i'm able to to pay people to help me do this and and work and make these documentaries uh do i think that i could scale this to a full-on team of 10 people i i don't think so um or, or even five people full-time i think because i've uh the way it's set up right now i think we're doing quality over quantity and i don't think that i could reasonably sustain a full scale business but but as far as an individual and as far as contracting like on a consistent basis with with other artists I, i'm very comfortable so so it, it is possible um uh, but i do think there is a ceiling if that answers that question um and then as far as my background i did go to film school uh for a time i ended up with a degree in in editing and media uh on on an english side of things so i actually have a background in both from an academic standpoint um, but a lot of this comes from just years of of independent research and 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 schooling definitely helped both both artistically and um, from a from you know editing and writing and 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 media. But I, I do think that a lot of the skills at a base level were developed from 
from just uh, just years and years of of, of doing research and, and getting better as well. And you can see, I, I think you can really see it on the channel. Those videos still exist, the original videos. If you were to go back and watch them, um, they're very different. And I think the evolution happened uh, on screen. So yeah. uh, it, it was very, very, it was a process. But yeah, <laughs> I was just wondering um, how you kind of touched on it there, like your your filmmaking process has developed and the output has developed over time. I just wonder, have you felt more beholden to like the dynamics of like algorithms and stuff on YouTube and um, when it comes to shaping your work? Or do you just kind of like see that as a as a sort of separate thing that will come later? Um, I'm just curious to hear how you found that. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um... I don't follow the algorithm as closely as others do. I don't, I post about two or three times a year now, uh, three times if I'm lucky. Um, and I'm lucky to do that. Um, and I think that part of this is luck and part of it is finding an audience, which is the hardest thing to do. And I, and I wouldn't pretend to have the the secret code to do it or the secret way of doing it. I, I just, it is one of those things where the, the luck matched up with, with my effort and that, that, that I'm very lucky for that. But I, I do follow more of trends in content, less, less from a title thumbnail level, but uh, more from a, what are people interested in? And especially in terms of length and runtime of a video, that's definitely changed based off of the, the nature of the audience, what videos they're clicking on and what videos YouTube's are, what videos YouTube are promoting. And, and so in, in that way, you know, I am making longer videos because I think audiences, when they go to YouTube, want longer videos. And then they go to other platforms such as TikTok or um, mm. Facebook or Instagram for shorter content. Um, and so this kind of middle ground of the 20 to 30 minute video um, is kind of non-existent. Um, in a lot of ways. And so, so to answer your question in that way, I do pay attention to those type of trends and I do, I don't feel beholden to them because they excite me. Um, that, that it's just basically saying audiences want this, they want longer videos. And to me, I'm just like, well, great. What does that look like? What does that runtime allow me? Um, but, but it is something I do think about. All right, Kevin, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank I think you. that's, that's all we yeah, have thank for you. today. Yeah, I so appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you.